Hello, I'm Maureen Reedy, the president and CEO of the Paley Center for Media, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to a very important Paley Impact Program, media's role in helping us talk about the Holocaust. This event commemorates International Holocaust Remembrance Day and is part of our ongoing effort to examine media's powerful shaping influence and unique ability to raise awareness around the growing crisis of anti-Semitism. This conversation is part of our quarterly series that seeks to shine a light on how media can educate, inform, and make an impact on this vitally important issue. All programs in this series are made possible by Shari Redstone and Arie and Alana Burkhoff, whom we thank for their most generous support. More than 70 years have passed since the end of the Holocaust, and yet anti-Semitism is still visible and an increasingly dangerous reality in our society. Recent violent acts, including the hostage standoff at Congregation Beth Israel in Kalevlu, Texas, have reminded us that all Jews remain a target of hate. At this critical time, there is also a lack of understanding and even awareness of the horrors of the Holocaust, particularly among young people. On this solemn occasion, we bring together several leading voices from education, politics, media, and the Jewish community to discuss how media can enable important conversations throughout our society about the realities of the Holocaust in a way that combats anti-Semitism and prevents further genocides. Never before has Paley's mission been more vital as media has been the undisputed connector during these unprecedented times. And Paley is uniquely positioned to meet this moment with impactful conversations led by influential leaders such as those that we are truly privileged to have with us today. We welcome to our conversation, Michael Bornstein, Holocaust survivor, Christopher Dodd, former United States Senator from Connecticut and part of the founding team of the Dodd Center for Human Rights, Daron Krakow, President and CEO of the JCC Association of North America, and Maria Zalewska, Executive Director of the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial Foundation. Before we start the program, I have one brief housekeeping note. If you are tweeting, our hashtag on Twitter is hashtag Paley. And we invite you to subscribe to the Paley YouTube channel and you can just click on the subscribe button below this video. Our moderator is Jim Axelrod, Chief Investigative and Senior National Correspondent for CBS News. Jim has received the Peabody Award for his coverage of West Virginia's opioid addiction crisis. And last year, he reported on the new beginning for Pittsburgh's Tree of Life Synagogue in the aftermath of that deadly attack. Please join me in welcoming Jim Axelrod. Over to you, Jim. Thank you, Maureen. And it is an honor to be part of this evening. As a longtime CBS News correspondent, the name Paley has a deep significance to me, but being able to moderate a conversation about how the media can help in discussing the issues related to the Holocaust is especially meaningful. So thank you. Again, I'm Jim Axelrod with CBS News, and we'd like to welcome Michael Bornstein, former Senator Chris Dodd. We'd like to welcome Daron Krakow and Maria Zalewska. Welcome all on this International Holocaust Remembrance Day. While we're talking about this horrific tragedy unfolding 80 plus years ago, I, I believe today is the 77th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Uh, it takes nothing more than a look back 12 days at the Colleyville, Texas hostage taking to understand the current uh, uh, relevance of discussing this topic. Um, the rabbi, remember, reported the gunman saying uh, in Colleyville that Jews controlled the world. So certainly uh, it underscores uh, how important it is to be examining this topic. I, I mean, just yesterday, uh, if you look at what the school board did in Tennessee, with the banning of Art Spiegelman's mouse, uh, you realize that almost on a daily basis, this is a topic uh, that we need to examine, how the media treats all these stories. So I'd like to begin by asking each of our panelists just for some opening thoughts about the idea of what the media can do to broker impactful and productive conversations about the Holocaust, and about anti-Semitism. Michael Bornstein, why don't we start with you? Uh, I believe the media can correct misinformation. And just like the uh, person 
in Texas who thought Jews were controlling the world and they were basically terrible. And we need to get that straight. Senator, you hear the same sound bites I do. Uh, you hear people talking about vaccine mandates as something akin to Nazi Germany. When the media is reporting stories like that, or when they're discussing the banning of a book that deals with the important uh, topics involving uh, escape from, from Nazi Germany, how do you feel the media should engage in dealing with the who, what, when, where, and why of a particular story, but also furnishing important context? Well, thank you, Jim, and it's delightful to be a part of this panel, and I thank the Paley Center for organizing it as well. Uh, number of thoughts. I, I, of course, grew up in a household where my father is a 37-year-old prosecutor with the Justice Department, ended up as the executive trial counsel at the Nuremberg Trials. It was a life-altering experience for him, so around our dining room table growing up in Connecticut uh, with my five siblings, I had a constant diet of my father's, about what, how did it happen? Why did it happen? Not only what happened, but how did a civilized country with uh, great universities, great culture, all of a sudden uh, accept and, and receive this monster, Adolf Hitler, and themselves through their silence contribute to this? And But for Nuremberg, we'd be have a, a difficult time because there are an awful lot of people who are deniers today. So we, we need to begin by understanding what happened and why and how it happened. And I think you can begin at a lot earlier age than people think on teaching this story. Uh, I think the media itself, Jim, needs to understand it better. And as uh, Eleanor Roosevelt once said, it's about close to home. Too often we don't have reporters at the local level that understand it as well. So when you have the story that you just mentioned, which is very important, uh, that someone compares taking vaccines or a math class is tantamount to being someone who was suffering in the Holocaust. Someone's got to speak up in the media at that very juncture and challenge that. If not, then that becomes a fact in people's minds. So uh, I, I'm glad we're doing this today. We need a lot more of it. Uh, Daron, I, I suppose we all need a little more Santayana in uh, our training. Those who uh, forget history are condemned to relive it. Uh, do, you, do you feel there is enough context uh, that the average reporter reporting on these stories carries with him or her? Well, I'd like to underscore the Senator's point. Well, first of all, uh, thanks to the Paley Center for convening a vitally important conversation and including me in it tonight. But I'd like to understand, underscore the Senator's point that there's a need for a greater uh, elevated commitment to contextualizing things that are happening and to contextualizing the way they're being reported. Uh, we are in an era where uh, trying to be uh, gratuitous in uh, the loudest, the most dramatic, the most dynamic points that are being made have had a Holocaust terminology and references uh, distorted to apply to all kinds of things taking place in the current context that when that language is used demean the memory of those who suffered uh, in the middle part of the last century in what was a unique and singular event. The media is our interpreters uh, for life as it's unfolding in front of us. And I think elevated understanding would enhance their ability to transmit the message responsibly. Maria, not, not only do we live in a soundbite culture, but those sound bites are shrinking every year. It used to be in the 60s, you might get a 20, 25 second soundbite during political coverage. Now the average soundbite sound bite, seven, eight seconds. How do you deal with addressing complex topics in a soundbite culture? Thank you, Jim, for this question. And I want to begin by thanking the Paley Center for Media for organizing tonight's event. And it's an honor to share this virtual stage with, with all of you. Um, you know, the conversation we're having tonight is, is truly the conversation about how to effectively educate about the Holocaust, how to effectively talk about the Shah. And an effective conversation about the Holocaust, being on TikTok, being on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or in real life or on TV, anywhere, um, it means to accomplish something. When we're thinking about um, the, the goal, um, accomplishing, uh, what is the end goal uh, that we all strive to approach? Um, I think that today on the International Holocaust Remembrance Day that marks the 77th anniversary of liberation of Auschwitz, we all repeat, we remember and never again. These two notions, we repeat and never again, reflect 
two interrelated but slightly different aspects of having effective conversations about the Holocaust. We remember means we share the information, we educate the Holocaust, we preserve the memory of the victims, but why do we do that? So that it never happens again. And that critical shift, that moment of decision-making between knowing and acting upon your knowledge, um, that's an ethical choice that I think is of greatest importance. Uh, you know, in my opinion, an effective conversation about the Holocaust today or in 10 years or in 20 years means bridging the gap between knowing and acting and between ignorance and indifference. Just a quick follow up on that, because, you know, I, I, I'm, I used to think um, that we could all agree on certain things, the sky being blue. I'm not so sure that we live in a culture where that actually is even possible to agree on something as basic like this. Um, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about this notion of both sides. This is an issue where you don't need both sides, but somehow the media seems often honor bound to present both sides. Uh, anybody take this one. Can we agree that maybe there are certain topics where both siderism doesn't help us? Senator Dodd? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great point to make. We heard that comment again, and we don't want to get political here, but you know, they're both they're good people on both sides. No, they weren't. <laughs> uh, and yet, again, I come back to Nuremberg because again, there were people highly critical of the Nuremberg trials. Uh, they thought it was a waste of time. It was ex post facto jurisprudence and so forth. We have today the evidence compiles at the Holocaust Museum in Washington. I donated my, all my father's papers to the University of Connecticut and started a human rights center as the basis of it. We have places now where the truth exists. Uh, had we not had that trial where the evidence was accumulated uh, in great detail today, we need not debate whether or not the facts are accurate, but there are still people today, the deniers and others. Imagine if we hadn't had the evidence. You can imagine today with fake news and the rest, what we'd be confronting and telling the story or trying to educate people about it. So I'm a great believer in the notion of doing what we can locally. I realize people like you, Jim, obviously are well known on a national scale and that's important as well. I don't minimize it. And you've done wonderful programming on 60 Minutes and so forth, telling stories, not just about the Holocaust, but the contribution of the Jewish community and the war efforts among other things. But at the local level, that close to home where human rights really begins at that school board meeting, where we don't allow that lie to persist day after day after day, and that's what contributes, in my view. Storytelling is critically important. Some people like, like Michael Bornstein, telling that story while well, a child at the time, Michael and, and those of us who are getting older, we're not going to be around forever. And who's going to tell that story after that? So the coming generations, World War II veterans are gone in many ways. Uh, they could tell that story as well. So to me, this is really over, long overdue uh, that we get back to this point again and not allow people to get away with as that teacher did recently here in a, in a child's classroom, having people play roles uh, of victims and Nazis uh, was an incredible story uh, that she got away with this. But it's an example of what can happen. So if there was a digital version of a Sharpie, I'd be underscoring everything you were just saying, because I, I think what you're saying is not just is all politics local, all media is local, oh. and, and we must focus. Michael Bornson, I, I want to ask you a question. I think you're in a unique position to give us all sort of a baseline. You share your highly personal story as one of the youngest survivors with kids all the time. Give us a baseline. How often are you surprised or perhaps saddened by what they do know or don't know in terms of basic understanding of the Holocaust? Thank you for asking. Uh, yes, I basically, when I talk to younger kids, I wanna to talk to them about the truth. And the truth is I was a four year old boy in Auschwitz, uh, basically with prisoner clothes. I was starving, uh, basically went out to garbage pail to try to find moldy peels, potato peels, uh, to try to get some nutrition. My father, was killed in Auschwitz. My mother, mother was in Auschwitz and sent to Austria. My younger, actually my older brother was killed in Auschwitz. And uh, there, you know, basically I think about the smell in Auschwitz 
uh, burning flesh smell. Uh, my daughter and I wrote a book called Survivors Club. Uh, and basically, uh, my picture is on there too. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, I uh, got out of Auschwitz and I did lost my hair uh, and it was basically terrible. Uh, kids were basically bullied. And that's what I tell kids when you're bullied and, and, and uh, uh, basically uh, stand up for the truth. Stand up for the truth. And education is one of the most important things that uh, will help us out. But Michael, when, when you tell the story of your family and may their memories be a blessing, when you tell that story, do the kids you're talking to today in, in 2022, do they look at you like, what? Do they, do, do, do they understand these things actually happened? Or are they looking at you like you're telling them some fiction? We've talked to hundreds and hundreds of kids. And usually you don't hear a pin drop when they talk. It's really wonderful. Uh, there was, we talked in Missouri and there was a boy who got up. He said he had never met a Jewish person before. And when I told the story about persecution, he said, you know, I'm glad you talked about it. It tells me that Jews are normal people and I can learn to love Jewish people like I love others. And that was extremely important. Let me just ask Daron and Maria, um, I wanna to talk to a little bit about expanding our definition of what media is uh, in terms of it's not just, you know, the TV stories or newspaper. Daron, check me on this statistic that I heard when we were prepping for tonight. I'm told between one third and one half of all people who come into JCCs are not Jewish. Is that correct? The statistic is roughly a third. That's correct. Okay. So that gives you an enormous opportunity, doesn't it, to address something like educating people about the Holocaust. How do, how do JCCs around the country think about this opportunity, or how should they? I appreciate the question, and uh, uh, Mr. Bornstein, uh, your story, like the stories of so many others, are chilling and a very critical reminder, I think, to all of us that We've been privileged to live lives at a time where the witnesses and survivors themselves have been so integral to the education process. And we're acutely conscious of the need for us to raise our game relative to continuing education when that access is more fleeting than it used to be. Jim, the answer to your question is uh, JCCs across 170 cities and towns uh, in this country welcome more than a million and a half people through their doors every single week when it's not a pandemic, uh, and roughly a million of them from the Jewish community, making the J, the town square of the Jewish community, a very diverse and broad audience. And then a half a million of our friends and neighbors who come through our doors because whatever it is that they want to do, they're preferring to do it with us than they can do it elsewhere. And it makes us, in a Jewish context, the largest platform for community relations on the continent as well. We see it as a primary responsibility, therefore, to be both representative of and promoters of educational endeavors that will raise consciousness in the community. And by the way, uh, the seniors in our community, both those that are themselves survivors or those that fought uh, in the Second World War and our veterans of that battle are part of the community that we engage on a daily basis. That creates a medium, if not media, for a kind of interaction of the type that Mr. Bornstein was describing that raises consciousness. So there's all kinds of, of interactions that I think are important. It's really, in my view, uh, crucial that we start expanding our definition. For instance, Maria, I was watching a, a documentary yesterday called 116 Cameras. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's a film by a documentarian named Davina Pardo about a, a survivor named Eva Schloss and Frank's uh, uh, step, stepsister. And um, Eva wants to preserve her story. So she makes a hologram of herself 
So long after she's gone, she'll be able to tell this story and interact with generations. What do you make of approaches like that? And, and I really want everyone who's watching to go find that film. It's remarkable. Yes, I'm, I'm very familiar with the project I, um, of the USC Shaw Foundation. Um, so, you know, media has always been a great way to connect people with the past. And when it comes to Holocaust education, ever since the first witness and survivor testimonies were recorded by the British Pathé and uh, Bergen-Belsen in April of 1945, the discussion of how to talk about the Holocaust, what are the limits of representation? Um, do, do we need to um, perhaps focus on a specific way of talking about the Holocaust? Are documentaries a more proper uh, way to talk about the past? How do we feel about uh, big blockbuster Hollywood movies that talk about? These questions have been um, you know, part of the discussion of media and Holocaust scholars since um, World War II. What has changed in the past, um, let's say 20 years are two things. One is this existential crisis that you mentioned the existential, existential crisis felt by all of us, uh, all of the Holocaust education institutions, you know, the question what happens when all the survivors are gone? It's almost palpable. And now it's even by the pandemic, it's, been, it's just become, I mean, Michael will agree with me, we're very connected to the group of Auschwitz-Birkenau survivors, or there's not a month that we don't lose one of the, one of the survivors. So that's the question number one. What do we do? You know, we have no idea, and we dread this notion of the world without uh, eyewitnesses of the Shah. And the second thing that intersects with this moment of existential crisis is uh, rapid technological um, rapid technological changes uh, that are happening in our lives, also sped up by the pandemic. I'm talking here about you know both technological actuality but also potentiality. Things we can already do in Holocaust remembrance, like the Zoom call, but also things that some organizations are developing: the holograms, uh, virtual reality. Um, uh, projects that virtualize particular places of memory that you can visit, augmented reality apps. Um, and this is an absolutely new angle to, to the process of Holocaust remembrance. So in other words, I, I think we've already, we not only entered, we're very anchored in this unique moment when online and offline regimes of memory and remembrance are intersecting. And then we have the social media piece. You know, I mentioned this 116 cameras uh, documentary, but just this morning on CBS uh, Mornings, there was a brilliant piece by a correspondent named Charlie Daggett profiling a 97-year-old woman named Lily Abair, who's telling her story on TikTok. She has 1.6 million followers on TikTok. So you really have to get to this point where you think about leveraging technology, don't you? Senator Dodd, that brings me to what the Dodd Center does in terms of leveraging technology. You have VR uh, technology that is telling the story. Um, tell us a little bit about what the Dodd Center does to address uh, the education piece of telling people what happened in the Holocaust through the most cutting edge technology. She, she won't like it, but let me, uh, let me thank Sherry Redstone because she's been behind this whole idea at the Dodd Center uh, to begin. We, for the last 25 years or so, we've had a program of training school teachers in 30 congressional 30, uh, school districts in Connecticut uh, about the Holocaust, about how it happened, why it happened, what they can learn to avoid it. We train teachers in the summer and they go back out. We have older students then do the same thing. It's sort of a holistic approach rather than a course per se. And so we need to expand that and grow that. We'd like that model to become maybe a national model. I wanna emphasize something here though. I mean, I think this is important. There's an assumption, well, this is a subject matter you gotta be at least old enough to appreciate because the story is a tough story. You talk about what people like Michael went through and his family went through. I believe that young pe younger people can actually learn. Civics is a great part of this thing. It isn't just the Holocaust and what happened, but why did it happen? Did people understand their rights? Did they understand what the rights of other people are? Civilized people decided to abandon basic rights that they embraced themselves. So we need to understand, and, and Sherry's a great advocate of this, by the way, that young people 
even children in elementary school can begin to understand what rights are. And in our society, if you can begin to understand what your rights are, talking about the Holocaust and what happened becomes a current topic in many ways. Uh, so it isn't just history we're talking about, because the expression not only is, is remember, but never again as well. And the never again depends that we educate a young generation coming along so that they understand what rights are, how important they are, and that regardless of your ethnicity, your religion, your race, that as a human being, you deserve to have those rights protected. And then when you start talking about what happened, when all of those, those features either are, are abused or thrown out or gotten rid of one way or another, it makes it easier for those who come along and want to deny what happened in the past or tell a different story about the Holocaust. So I, I agree very much with the idea that we make a false assumption that even elementary school children, if taught properly, can understand what their rights are. I understand you might want to relieve the, the, the tough story of the Holocaust to be a little older to understand it and appreciate it, but you can begin a lot earlier than most people think. So it isn't just the media, social media, TikTok, all of that helps. But again, I come back and I sound like a broken record, Jim, I suppose, but that idea of human rights close to home. Uh, if you can if you get people at a local level to begin to understand this and push back, it's much easier to make that case on a grander scale, but you've got to begin there. I think it's very important to keep repeating the message. I guess my question is when the Dodd Center was trying to figure out the best ways to do that, the best ways to hammer home this message, there was this adoption of, of VR and gaming technology that had to do with giving people an experience a sense of what Nuremberg and the trials must have been like. Yeah. I know this was something very important in your family. Yeah. Your father was executive trial counsel. But can you just tell me a little bit about the, the thinking, the thought process of, hey, we know what we want to talk about, but this is how we're going to do it to get the, the, the next generation's attention? Well, part of it is to make it current. You know, an awful lot of people in this country, it's a majority, a narrow majority, but a majority believe that Hitler came to power through force. They don't recognize or believe that he was elected to office uh, here. And that a lot of people around them were not necessarily inherently bad. They were silenced. They were frightened. They were a lot of things. My father used to say around our dining room table growing up as children, don't ever believe for a second that the average person, adult in Germany, didn't know what was going on. They did. Uh, it's one of the great tragedies in history, in my view, that otherwise decent and good people succumb to this out of fear or a lot of other factors along the way. So you, you need to understand, again, make people understand that Nuremberg was revealing. It provided the opportunity for us to have the documentation. So there's no longer debate about whether or not it happened or, or how it happened, in a sense. Uh, and so we want to make that a current story, in a sense, because frankly, a lot of us today know, excuse me, my office light just went out. I apologize, that, that uh, uh, an awful lot of people believe today we're looking around the world where a lot of basic rights and so forth that we've accepted as never changing are under assault. Uh, so if we don't make the Holocaust story a current story, not just an historical story, then I think it's a harder sell, frankly. So we're trying to achieve that by utilizing, as Maria talked about, some of the new technologies so people who, who go to those sources to find information will also find this story and what they can do and how it happened and why it happened. Michael, what are you thinking when you're listening to the Senator? I completely agree with the center, Senator. I, I think getting information to the media and transmitting that information, the truth is extremely important, but it's also important for schools to teach Holocaust education. I know there's a requirement in New Jersey to uh, uh, teach Holocaust education, but I think other states need to do that as well. And that is critical. We do it in Connecticut, Michael, too. I'm not sure how well it's done, but I, I appreciate the state legislature adopted that some years ago. And I, I think the intentions were good. But you got to make sure it gets done right as well. So I, I agree, New Jersey, Connecticut, about 20 states, I think. And, and Doran, you'll correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think it's around 20 states out of 50, maybe a little bit more, that actually have a requirement to teach Holocaust education. And that is why we go around to different schools. Uh, right now, we're scheduled to go to Iowa 
uh, for, I believe, around four days to four different school, schools, maybe more than four, and talk about Holocaust education. And I think that's critical. We usually have lines and lines for signatures of the books when we do that. So uh, I think that's critical. You know, Michael, you showed your book. I'm going to show my book, too. <laughs> my father wrote my mother every day from Nuremberg during those 18 months, 400 letters, 8, 10, 12 pages letter every night, uh, despite the fact he had 180 lawyers he was working with at Nuremberg. I only discovered them in 1993. Uh, I didn't know that. I heard about them. And I, I read them. And it was, uh, first of all, the great love letters. Uh, and I, I was one of six children. I, I wondered who this guy was writing to my mother this way. Uh, <laughs> And then, uh, and then, of course, he tells through a first draft of history what he thought of the experience, what he thought of defendants, what he thought of prosecutors. And it was really an eye opener for me in many, many ways to realize, uh, first of all, how important the event was uh, and what a difference it made in his life. He said towards the end of the service, he said, I'll never do anything. He's 37 years old, 38. He said, I will never do anything as important again in my life. Uh, it's rather a remarkable comment for a 37 year old to make that had such a profound influence on him. And everything he did after that was in some way or another directed by his experience during those 18 months at Nuremberg. So reading those letters, and I do over and over again, I was reading it tonight in preparation of our meeting here, reminded me again uh, that, it, uh, again, all he went through and so forth has been terribly important in reminding people how it can happen again. It's remembering and also never again and making sure, and you're doing what you're doing, Michael, is a great, great service to the country. It is such a uh, lost art, the art of letter writing. I often uh, wonder what historians are going to do when they're looking at our, our contemporary life. Are they going to look at tweets? I mean, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, such depth to your father's letters to his mother. So uh, let, me, let me go down the line here. Daron, I want to start with you, um, because we're, we're really assessing, uh, in addition to talking about what the media is doing and what its responsibility is and how it can improve, I, to ask each one of you what your frustrations are currently with the media, especially when it comes to doing stories that are unfolding in real time, but that are rooted or have an important context that relates back to the events of 80 plus years ago. Duran? You know, I've been reflecting during the course of this remarkable conversation on the words of a former colleague of the senators uh, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who had said uh, that everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own set of facts. And I think we're living at a time where there is an assault on facts uh, and the legitimization of questioning whether things happened in the way narratives have been told, uh, which creates a greater challenge for those of us who are dedicated to telling important and hard truths, particularly those about history. Uh, particularly those about this chapter of history. Uh, and the fact that, again, uh, there are references made uh, by people in prominent places using terminology attributable to the Holocaust and to the events of that time and applying them to things for which they bear no reasonable comparison undermines the significance of our ability, uh, undermines our credible ability to deliver the kind of uh, historical education that's necessary to assure that this particular uh, nightmare is never repeated. Uh, so the important thing, I think, is to find as many mediums as possible, uh, with as many audiences as possible, to assure that truth is shared and facts are understood. Yeah. Maria, I, I give you the magic wand and allow you to wave it at newsrooms across the country uh, to make the changes necessary um, as you see fit to improve the job media is doing in discussing issues related to both the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. What do you do? What changes do you make? I would talk to um, social media platforms. I think, you know, going one step back and you you asked about the, the emergence of new technologies and this radical shift um, of who's setting the tone for Holocaust education and information dissemination. Uh, we've witnessed this decentralization of Holocaust education. Suddenly, it's not only institutions um, or, or governments that are curating lessons of the past. Now, every single person with a, with a smartphone can participate in the process of not only Holocaust memory archive building, but, but you know, being, being a seeming expert on everything. And I think that 
with this proliferation of information, there's this information misinformation dynamic that we've just discussed. And as we celebrate the successes of social media campaigns, uh, for example, that we remember campaign launched by the, the World Jewish Congress, we also have to deal with Holocaust deniers who suddenly have a platform to share their lies. Um, that's why announce, announcements like this week's announcement, um, the World Jewish Congress, UNESCO and TikTok, um, their initiative that offers comprehensive Holocaust education resources to the global community of TikTok users. Every time you look up something about the Holocaust, it takes you to uh, the website www.aboutholocaust.org. I mean, I welcome initiatives like that, you know, fact checking. And it is when you enter a library or an archive, you need to have a research question. And I think helping people find those answers online in a, in a thoughtful um, and, um, you know, well-designed way is crucial. Well, it's, it's like, I, I know you, every day I watch, uh, I look at, and I'm, I'm sure you do as well, that the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial Foundation has those very moving profiles of people who lost their lives. Um, and it's enough, it, it sort of grabs you by, by the heart. But what you're saying is, okay, then you need the head to follow by having places to go sort of once you are engaged that will allow uh, the, the necessary depth to fully understand and appreciate um, sort of how all of this happened, right? I, I, yes, and I think we've entered, you know, especially with the, with the virtual and augmented reality um, apps, we have entered a very um, uncharted territory. Yeah. Who, is, who has the agency and should be accountable for specific decisions? For example, a couple of years ago, there was a case um, a case of people playing Pokemon Go in Auschwitz. Uh, Pokemon Go, for, for those of you who haven't played it, it's an um, augmented reality game. I remember part. this. Yeah, so people were, you know, walking around with their cell phones and, and catching Pokemon in Auschwitz. This was picked up by the American media. And then besides the ethical questions that this raises, you know, the, the sort of the the transgressive nature of, of such interaction with the sacred place of Auschwitz-Birkenau. There are other questions that are very interesting and new. Who is in charge? Is it the museum, the institution that should um, basically say you cannot do this? Or is it in the hands of the user? Hmm. Or is it the platform? Is it the app design, you know, um, designer, owner who um, should limit it? So I don't think we've caught up fully to, to the speed with which we have to rethink those new encounters with not only um, you know, virtual places of Holocaust remembrance, but particular physical spaces of where the Holocaust happened. But these aren't particularly difficult questions for anybody doing a story on say the, what you're describing about the Pokemon Go thing in, in Auschwitz, anybody doing a story on that, it's not, that complicated to ask these questions as part of that reporting or to assign another reporter to uh, a think piece that comes out of the, hey, this is what's happening. And then maybe let's make sure media outlets then assign uh, a story about and why and what does it mean and whose responsibility is it to preclude that from happening? It's just a question of understanding that needs to be done. Absolutely. However, with for example, issues of taking selfies in Auschwitz. This is something I, I worked on a while ago. My instant reaction was, I, 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 I wasn't okay with it. My instant reaction was, this is not okay, right? <laughs> and then I spoke to my students and their media literacy level, even though they were 10 years younger than me, so it wasn't even a generational gap. Their response was, no, we take selfies because this is our way of archiving our presence at a specific location. They didn't see it as transgressive. So I think also we have to be careful. Um, and, and, you know, and, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm actually consider myself very conservative um, in terms of my thinking about new technologies. But I think we also have to be careful in, in considering the dramatically um, um, changing levels of media literacy among, among us. And something that we might perceive as transgressive is viewed as, as appropriate by others. So that's also, I mean, it brings in another angle of this conversation. Well, Michael, let me ask you about that angle. Um, what do you make of 
just the image of kids taking selfies at Auschwitz. Well, I think Auschwitz to me is a hollow ground. And I agree with Maria. Uh, just a couple of years ago, Ronald Lauder uh, took a number of survivors to Auschwitz and Maria being director of the Auschwitz Birkenau Foundation was there and that was very moving. But I think right now the media needs to continue talking about the atrocities of Auschwitz. Even after the survivors are gone, we can't forget because uh, we, it needs to continue. Uh, I, when I talk to kids, I, I say, Gamze Yavor, this too shall pass. And that is really something that they need to understand. I also want to show you uh, some roses that I got from con the Consulate General of Poland today. And uh, there were some children that wrote to me and saying, again, never forget. And uh, I, I think it can happen again, but I think we need to talk continue to talk about what happened and the atrocities and see if we can educate, not just kids, but adults. Uh, you, you see a uh, person in high places talked about neo-Nazis and saying there are good people on both sides. Well, I don't think that's true. And I, and I think that needs to be suppressed, I'm sorry. But information like that does not belong in the media. Michael, I just want to say thank you for showing us the picture of the roses. I could use a little hope tonight, and I'm sure I'm not alone. And that, that's such a hopeful uh, thought that those kids are writing you. Um, Senator, we have about uh, enough time for everyone to take a minute on this last question. Okay. Let's say it's five years from now, January 27th, 2027. What would you like to have seen in terms of the evolution of media's ability to discuss, to handle, to cover any story that has roots in the Holocaust or anti-Semitism? How would you like to see the media evolve so that when we're doing this, uh, this uh, panel in five years, we can say we've seen this progress? Well, I think Maria has brought up some great points. And uh, I appreciate especially your last point, Maria, about your students. In a sense, I think we have to catch up in a sense. Uh, some of us here got a little gray hair and, and getting older and what we rely on and where we get our information is different than where my 16 year old and 20 year old daughters get their information every day. And I think we need to get in touch with that or we're gonna be left behind. So I'm particularly grateful to Maria for making that point about her students, what their intentions are. I think it's important as well that, that storytelling is so important and, and uh, we give out a book award at the Dodd Center for Human Rights every year. We gave it last year to a book called The White Rose. And The White Rose were about teenage Germans who actually went after the Nazis and in fact executed some of them. And again, lost all of their lives in the process of doing so. But we need to tell, there were stories that need to be told on both, again, the side here, there were good people who stood up and had the guts and the courage to take on the Nazis. I think that's an important part of this as well. Uh, and, and there are people in, in Germany, particularly, which have done more in some ways of recognizing the horrors of the Holocaust. Uh, and I think that's important. That 75 years later, we need to encourage people to keep that up. Unfortunately, not as many countries are doing what the Germans are doing, ironically, where Maria is from has been very slow to a large extent in Poland, uh, where things happened. So I think that's an important thing we need to do. And as I said earlier, I think we've got to get over the notion you can't teach young children. I, I think you can't begin early enough with civics, what rights are and so forth. That is so important in telling the story because it was the abandonment of all of that in a sense. They gave a license, if you will, to what Nazis and Hitler and others were doing. So to me, I'd love to see a, 10 years from now, someone talking about the very ideas that Maria raised about utilizing modern technologies and communications, understanding how young people particularly get their information, how they absorb it, and how they react to it. I think we can make great strides forward if we do that. And moving quickly, because we are yeah, so, almost out of time. Daron, uh, some, some final thoughts. I would just briefly say, uh, Jim, that I think we would hope that the media would view with humility 
their growing responsibility uh, to help assure that the stories are told and told thoughtfully and accurately in a period in which, again, firsthand witnesses will no longer be at our ready disposal. There's a word we don't hear enough when discussing public discourse, humility. Maria? Um, in, in five years, I would like to be sitting next to Michael um, in person um, in Auschwitz-Birkenau. When it comes to the media coverage of these topics, I would like to see more interest on days that are not January 27th and Yom yes. Hashoah. There are huge spikes in, you know, of course, it, it's, it's obvious why, but I wish there was more coverage. And going back to what Senator Dodd said, I think that the civics lessons and remembering, uh, per, um, quoting survivor Marian Turski, Auschwitz didn't fall from the sky. So making those connections about specific policies and decisions that created the atmosphere and context in which Auschwitz-Birkenau came to be. Yeah, thank you. And Michael Bornstein, we're going to give you the last word here, uh, or at least the last 30 seconds. Can you just Yes, first of all, I agree, yes, I agree with Maria, and I'd like to be there at, in Auschwitz uh, and uh, hug Maria at that place, if that's okay with her. Uh, and I just want to again mention that the media needs to correct misinformation. That is absolutely critical. Uh, I'll end it there because I know you need to cut us off, but... Uh, uh, I think it's been a really good discussion, and thank you for inviting me. I, I can't begin to articulate my gratitude. Uh, I'll simply say thank you uh, to uh, Daron Krakow, Maria Zalewska, Michael Bornstein, Senator Chris Dodd. Um, we are just so grateful for your insight tonight. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining the Paley Impact Program. Thank you once again to Sherry Redstone as well as Arye and Alana Burkhoff. Uh, their generous support has uh, helped us have this discussion tonight. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to the Paley Center YouTube channel right now. Uh, you can do that by clicking on the subscribe button, which is just below this video. Uh, be sure to support the Paley Center and consider becoming a Paley member by visiting paleycenter.org. Thank you again, everyone, and we wish you Good night. Thank you, John. Good night.